For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. On July 23rd, the Supreme Electoral Court in Bolivia postponed the election scheduled for September 6th, citing the COVID-19 pandemic. Bolivian social movements have rejected the decision, which they see as another attempt by the coup installed government to extend their usurpation of power. Today, we're joined by Oli Vargas, a Bolivian journalist from Kausasha News, who's been on the ground following the development since the coup in November, which took Evo Morales out of office and has been documenting the tremendous resistance against the dictatorship. Thank you so much for joining us, Ali. Um, so first off, wanted to ask, um, since the announcement on July 23rd, when the Supreme Court has announced that, of course, they will be postponing the elections once again, um, what has been the response from the people's movements? Um, there have been massive mobilizations. So what have been the key demands? Uh, what organizations are on the streets? Um, what actions are being taken? So as soon as it was announced, it was quite, you could tell that the president of the Electoral Council when he was announcing this postponement, is, this is the fourth postponement, or well, this is the third postponement of the elections this year. He, he had quite a sort of nervous disposition because he knew that there would be a huge amount of anger against the decision. And so immediately afterwards, the social movements uh, began pronouncing themselves so to 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 make clear their rejection of this suspension first to come out were the indigenous groups that affiliated to the movement towards socialism so that includes the pacto de unidad which is the indigenous women's confederation that is the a number of indigenous groups uh, as well affiliated to that but then what's most important i think was that the national labor union federation came out to announce mobilization now, the National Labor Union Federation is called the Central Obrera Boliviana. They're not actually affiliated to the mass, and they didn't mobilize against the coup in November. So to have their support gives an extra uh, strength to the mobilizations and an extra sort of level of organization to the, the protests that, uh, that have already started and will be intensifying in the, in the week ahead. So there's a huge amount of sort of very structured organization amongst social movements on the ground. We saw the strength of that on uh, Tuesday when there was a mass march held right across the country. Mass marches, I should say, held right across the country, organized by the National Labor Union Federation, the Central Obrera Boliviana. And they decided at these, at these rallies that they would give the, the government and the electoral court a deadline after which, if they're not listened to, they will begin uh, what they call roadblocks and an indefinite general strike. The roadblocks means that uh, they'll mobilize the power of the indigenous or rural workers to block the key highways in the country to stop basically all uh, economic activity between the different uh, cities and departments of the country. So that is the power that they have to bring the country to the halt. And they say that they'll use that power on Monday if the government haven't retracted that from their position of suspending the elections again. Yeah, and what has been the response to these mobilizations? I mean, since November, since the coup, uh, the organized movements have faced tremendous amounts of repression. Um, you know, there were two massacres that happened following the mobilizations against the coup. And so this time around, in this kind of recent wave of mobilizations, what kind of, what has been the response of the Bolivian security forces? Well, the first response was to open criminal charges, file criminal lawsuits against the main leaders, social movement leaders, uh, accusing them of armed uprising. So that was what's been filed against uh, the union, the, the main union leader in this region, in the tropical Cochabamba, uh, Leonardo Losa, is a rural campesino leader. He has charges now for armed uprising. The same has been put up against the leader of the National Workers Federation, uh, Juan Carlos Guarachi. And they've both said quite clearly that they're, they're not intimidated by this. They're gonna continue with the mobilizations despite the threats of, of the government. And in particular, the interior minister is a guy known as Arturo Murillo. And he is sort of the most authoritarian figure within the government. He, as I said, without any evidence, he's decided that these protests, these mass protests that are taking place uh, constitute an armed uprising despite the fact that no one has any weapons no one is armed 
the only uh, the only weapon they have is sort of unity, is a sort of strength through sheer numbers that they can mobilize on the streets. And uh, Leonardo Losa, the leader from this area, he said to the interior minister, hey, you can come and arrest me, but you have to do it yourself and you have to come here. And you have to arrest me in front of my uh, rank and file bases. Um, something that the government is incredibly worried about doing because in areas such as these, and in every single rural area in the country, in fact, the, the mass has support of well over 80% of the population in the rural areas. And uh, to arrest, to try and carry out as that level of repression here will be met with a huge amount of resistance by uh, by local people. So it is uh, while the government threatens, the social movements have replied by refusing to back down and in fact challenging the government. So I think the sort of fear that has been instilled in people up till now has begun to melt away. Um, but the second thing that the government are trying to do is they're trying to pin uh, these accusations of armed uprising on the movement towards socialism itself and their candidates, their presidential candidates, Luis Arce, saying that he's the one who's organising all this and that's an excuse to ban them from standing in the elections, which is sort of the long-standing project they've had throughout uh, the past eight months. And again, uh, no, no, one, no one feels intimidated at this point, because, precisely because the social movement now are much more united than they were just after the coup, and people feel their strength in, in numbers and the potential to mobilise uh, millions of people on the streets. For sure. And I mean, I think you got at something there is that I think in the international realm, kind of people have this uh, per false perception that, you know, no, Abel wasn't that popular. You know, people were really against him. They don't support the movement uh, towards socialism, mass. But obviously we see in this, you know, very pointed repression in the postponing of elections that actually this is, you know, motivated by the right wing's fear of the power of mass. So I don't know if you can talk about a little bit about um, Kind of what was the what is the electoral scenario shaping up to be? Um, what is the true support uh, from the people towards um, mass in this context? Well, the movement towards socialism has a huge amount of support. We we'll remember in the elections in October, they they won the elections, uh, forty seven percent of the vote. Uh, the, all the accusations of fraud have been debunked since then by the Center for Economic and Policy Research by the Washington Post by the New York Times. So that's the, um, the base of support that the, the mass has in the country, so just under 50%. However, it's true that that has become, over the past sort of 10 years, much more polarized geographically and among class lines. So where in, uh, say, 2009, the mass had a much wider level of support. Now their support is concentrated in the working class areas of the cities and in the rural areas where before they might have had a bit more middle class support. Now, uh, their power, their, their sort of social base is in the, the, the popular districts of the three main cities. So that's El Alto, Zona Sur de Cochabamba, the Plan Tres Mil of Santa Cruz. That is the sort of the poorest areas of the big cities uh, where they have a solid rock of support. And then the rural areas where, as I said earlier, the mass uh, is impossible for them to get less than about 80% of the vote uh so that it, and that's become reflected in the sort of uh, political discussions so it's become uh, so the political discourse of the right of the pro coup forces has become a lot a lot more racialized in recent years i would say precisely because they were very aware of the fact that they have the support of uh the large the right has the support of the vast majority of sort of middle class uh, mixed race, white people in the country, whereas they're not able to speak to and to connect with the the majority of, of sort of working class and indigenous sections of the country. So there's a much bigger polarization on class lines and along um, geographical lines. But what I mean by geographical is racial lines, because you know who lives in the, in the rural areas? It's overwhelmingly indigenous communities. So. I think there's a, and it's those sections that have been the most affected by the economic crisis caused over the last eight months, and their their support for the mass has become even more entrenched. I think we're likely to actually see an increase in support in the rural areas from about 80% to 90% for the mass because of the level of, of, of suffering 
uh, especially not just during the quarantine, but before um, by the economic crisis, triggered by a number of neoliberal reforms. So I think the mass can rely on uh, almost 50% of the vote. And that will give them a first round victory because there's no uh, second place candidate they can get anywhere near that. Under Bolivia's constitution, you can win in the first round if you're 10% uh, ahead of the of second place. And the right wing candidate, the most popular right wing candidate, Carlos Mesa, can't get anywhere above about 25% of the vote. And the, the current president, self declared president, Henry Nanez, is also standing. She's at lingering about 15% of the vote. So uh, they're, they're training behind, and the mass has managed to. Uh, sort of uh, regroup all of the social forces that delivered its electoral victory in October 2019. Yeah, so kind of one more question about the electoral scenario. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, corruption allegations that have come out during the COVID-19 pandemic that have seemed to created rifts between within the right wing and they seem unable to kind of reconcile and have a united front. So can you talk a little about these splits that have been happening, maybe getting worse? under the economic crisis that's um, been happening? Yeah, there's a, I think the right in Bolivia has historically been very divided throughout the past 14 years. They've never been able to present a united front against the mass. Um, and the moment is no different. Camacho, uh, he actually is against the new postponed date. He says the election should be cancelled altogether until uh, there's no pandemic, you know, i.e. an indefinite date, possibly never. So that's the position of the kind of more extreme, the more sort of street fighting, violent section of the Bolivian right. Uh, I'm sure that has something to do with the fact that they're trailing sort of fourth, fifth in the polls. But the position of the sort of more centre ground neoliberal, sort of centrist neoliberal candidate, Carlos Mesa, is that he wants elections uh, sort of as soon as possible, actually. He was strong-armed into accepting this postponement precisely because he knows that he is the right-wing candidate that will go into a second-round runoff against the mass if the such as you know if the country reaches such a situation. But the government has pressured him into accepting uh, the new date, and the government has interest in postponing the elections indefinitely because, as I said earlier, they're trailing behind third in the polls. There, there's a tremendous economic crisis going on right now in Bolivia. I think the latest figures from CELAG shows that 38% of the country has lost the, the entirety of their income and 52% has lost a part of their income. So that's 90% of the population that have lost their income and not been provided with any support, uh, sort of income support during this time. So there's a huge amount of anger swelling up against the government that the other right-wing candidates want to try and distance themselves from this sort of disaster that's unfolding. So we, we can see the sort of splits opening up on, on, on those lines as well. And then finally, I just wanted to ask about, you know, in your own personal experience being a journalist in the post-coup um, scenario, uh, we've seen a lot of reports of, you know, attacks on journalists. I think some of the strongest images, or one of the very powerful images um, during the coup um, you know, was attacks on these journalists, forcing them to leave the state-owned um, radio station, TV station. And how has that continued? How have uh, you and your comrades at Kawasha News uh, been facing this? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult situation for those reporting in the country. Um, my own people I know, friends, who ran a left-wing radio show called La Resistencia, they're now in Argentina because the arrest orders were sort of put out against them in December, uh, saying that they were, um, uh, their radio show was seditious and an incitement to terrorism. Uh, my own colleague here at the radio, Landon Marca, was arrested uh, a couple of months ago while reporting on a, sort of a social movement event uh, back then. He still has those criminal charges hanging over him though he's been freed provisionally for now. Uh, the, the signal of the radio itself has been essentially jammed or taken over in a number of different municipalities. The, so the equipment that helps transmit the signal in the Amazon department of Beni that has been seized by the state. And we know that the, for a long time, the, the state has wanted to intervene 
to sort of shut the radio down altogether. The only thing stopping them right now is the geographical sort of location in which we have we're surrounded by uh, the best organised social movements in the country here in Cochabamba, which is the six federations, uh, the Campesino unions, which Evo himself uh, was the leader of before he became president. I think that's the only thing that's stopping them from attacking altogether. And as we move into conflicts starting Monday, we'll see an increased attack on, our, uh, on journalists. I'm sure we'll be accused of incitement to armed rebellion, sedition, terrorism, that sort of thing. That's the sort of charges that are being put out against anyone who uh, raises their head above the parapet and criticizes the current uh, US backed regime. Yeah, well, thank you so much for all of the coverage that you guys are doing to help inform the people of the world what's happening in Bolivia. Uh, it's of utmost importance that we continue to follow the events happening there and, you know, expressing all of our support to the movements on the ground. So. Thank you so much for, for helping shine a light on, on this issue. Yes, and that's all we have time for. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah,